Channel 5's Pauletta Longo, keeping you in touch. From ABC News. This week with David Brinkley. Now from our Washington headquarters, here's David Brinkley. It looked like a victory in the Gulf War a year ago. It put President Bush so high in the polls it seemed he could walk into a second term with little effort. But look at it now. The Gulf War victory is incomplete, so much so there's some chance of military action against Saddam Hussein again. And the polls, still early, unreliable, and certain to change, even so show the president running behind Bill Clinton by more than two to one. We will examine both of these events in our rapidly changing modern history with today's guest. Lawrence Eagleberger, Acting Secretary of State, Jack Kemp, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Bush Cabinet, and William Bennett, who has served in both the Reagan and Bush Cabinets, some background from our man Jack Smith, and our discussion here with George Will, Sam Donaldson, and Pierre Salinger, here on our Sunday program. First, a little news. Talks with the Iraqis are scheduled to go on today at the United Nations. UN inspectors in Baghdad are trying to get inside what they call the Agricultural Ministry Building to look for documents on Iraqi weapons. The Iraqis have been saying, no, you can't come in. Defense Secretary Cheney was out this morning taking a tough line against Saddam Hussein. The message should be very clear. Uh, he needs to comply with the UN resolutions. That's been the problem since August 2nd of 1990. And uh, we are once again in one of those positions where he has acted as though he wants to confront rather than cooperate with the United Nations. And that's why uh, we're at this moment, uh, I think around the world, there's a sense that uh, uh, it's important to convey to him the message that he does indeed have uh, no choice but to comply. Other news, the Washington Post says Lawrence Walsh, the special prosecutor appointed by the Democratic Congress, will decide soon if he will try to indict Ronald Reagan, plus three members of his administration, George Shultz, Ed Meese, and Donald Reagan. Walsh thinks they may have tried to cover up some part of the Iran-Contra scandal. The Chicago Tribune, in an editorial today, calls on President Bush to replace Dan Quayle as his candidate for vice president. The P Tribune said, quote, he is still the object of national ridicule. We'll be back with all the rest of today's program in a moment. This week with David Brinkley, brought to you by GE. From plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. And by ADM, supermarket to the world. Every seven seconds of every day, someone is going somewhere with GE. Because over 200 of the world's airlines rely on the power of GE jet engines. Tokyo and Kokomo, America's Yamuka Fest in Sydney, Monte Carlo, San Diego, Santiago, Barcelona, Arizona, Bora Bora, Clacamora, and Siena, and Vienna, and New York and County Cork. GE in the air, we'll be there. And since every year more and more people are going to more and more places, GE has developed the jet engine of the future, the GE90. More powerful, more fuel efficient, cleaner, and quieter than any jet engine ever made. Petersburg in Uruguay and Malibu and Paraguay and Rome and Santa Fe and Cincinnati and LA and there is Canada and Malaga and Rimini and Brindisi, New Delhi, Kansas City and a town without a penny. GE, Every seven seconds to an airport near you. News in two places on a busy weekend. The threat of more military action in Iraq and the election campaign in this country. First, Iraq and the first of two background reports from Jack Smith. Jack? David, the president has been meeting this weekend with his national security advisors discussing the wording of an ultimatum to the Iraqis and the possibility of joint military action with the Allies. The showdown occurred after Iraqi mobs this week threatened UN inspectors. We're leaving here now for security reasons. Iraq refused to let the inspectors into Baghdad's agriculture ministry to examine documents there on its banned nuclear, chemical, and missile weapons programs, a clear violation of last year's ceasefire. 
U.S. officials say it's all part of a pattern. Is the across-the-board defiance that we see in Iraq of the U.N. resolutions. Saddam Hussein is still starving the Kurds and using his army and aircraft to kill Shiites. However, inviting Western retaliation does make a sort of weird sense for him in the region. He will be seen again as resisting the West, resisting secularism, as the man who stood up to this vast external machine. The confrontation comes at a time when Secretary of State James Baker is reportedly ready to step down. But you haven't heard that yet. No, but Baker hasn't denied it either, and is expected to go ahead Bush's shaky re-election campaign next month, and that could affect the Middle East. The accession to power in Israel of the more moderate Labor Party under Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, it's hoped, will revive the peace process. The Arabs, for the first time, believe they have an Israeli leader who actually does want to reach an agreement, including a compromise on territory. We started a new momentum for peace. But as Baker's own Middle East tour this week showed, diplomacy in the region requires a lot of hand-holding. And now with a new phase, with the Labor Party in power in uh, Jerusalem, I think his uh, role is quite critical, so if he leaves, uh, it could suffer. And this leaves Baker's deputy, Larry Eagleburger, at the helm with a raft of intractable problems, not to mention Saddam Hussein. David? Jack, thank you. Here with us now is the acting Secretary of State, Lawrence Eagleburger. Thank, yeah. Thanks for coming. Glad to have you. Pleasure. Here in the studio are George Will and Sam Donaldson. Now first, Mr. Secretary, bring us up to date. What's, where do we stand at the moment? With Iraq. With Iraq. Well, Mr. Achaeus and the Iraqi uh, ambassador to the UN are supposedly going to get back together and talk some more today about the problem of the standoff with regard to the agricultural ministry. I personally suspect that uh, in the end the Iraqis will back down and let the inspectors into the agriculture ministry, but we don't have that settled yet. Well, if it is an agricultural ministry, why would they <coughs> care? What do they say? About well, our, our suspicion, or rather the suspicion of the inspectors, is that there may be a lot more in that building other than books about cows and dairies. And grass seed and fertilizer. We spent the last three weeks trying to uh, get people in there to inspect it. I must say, even if it gets settled today, the fact that we've spent three weeks trying to get into the building would, it seemed to me, be likely to obviate the value of the inspection in the sense there may be a great deal that's disappeared from the building that may have been there three weeks ago. The question is, what can we threaten him with? Uh, can we threaten him with military action? What targets would there be? Yeah. And he seems to have a very high pain threshold when it's his own people suffering. Well, I, you know, without implying that we will in fact go to military action, that is not a decision that's that up to me to make. It's for the president. But yes, there are a good many targets that could be attacked, running from uh, things like communications facilities to the forces that are in the south attacking the Shias. There are a whole host of targets available still, and I think that out clearly has to be one of the alternatives. You know, the fact of the matter is, this is not just an issue of this agriculture building. By count, he has violated at least six and probably seven different uh, Security Council resolutions, a whole host of different problems. And this is clearly just one piece of a challenge to the whole question of UN control of in the post-war period. Okay, uh, now we come to the question of why we're there and what we're doing. We first went in in 1990 because uh, it was to repel aggression. Right. Now it seems to be that we are implicated in and bound to act to defend the credibility of the UN. Is that now a central goal of American policy and that we have to act and we have to use our, be prepared to use our force or threaten the use of force in order to make the UN credible? In order to make the UN credible in this particular case, I think you've made a point, George, which is correct, but look at it here. Saddam Hussein, since the end of the war, having accepted a whole host of Security Council resolutions, may have been a problem for himself and for his people. But so long as the UN and the international community have remained firm on insisting on compliance with all of the resolutions, he has not been a threat to the peace in the area. So that we are, if you want to make the point that we are defending the, the UN, I suppose I can accept the point. But the point is, we're doing it for a purpose, which is to keep the man from being a threat in the region, and thus far we have succeeded in that. You have said today what Secretary Baker said <coughs> yesterday, which is that it's not just the question of the agriculture ministry. Right. That there's a whole range of defiance of UN resolutions. 
So the question to you is, if he does back down, as you have a hunch he may, and let inspectors into the Agriculture Ministry building, is that enough? No, I don't think that is enough. I think, as we've already said publicly, he has to comply with the range of Security Council resolutions. Now, how we get him there, that's an open question. But it is not simply enough, I think, that he, gets, he lets us into the Agriculture Ministry. Well, let me draw you out on that, because it seems clear from all of the statements that you and others have made in this administration and our allies have made, that if he doesn't let the inspectors in the Agriculture Ministry, something will happen. Correct. Something will happen. But if he lets you into the Agriculture Ministry, even though that's not enough, does that delay then action? Well, obviously, again, Sam, we're going to have to go to the UN and discuss the issue anyway, but it does not mean that something will not happen, if I can use a double negative. Simply because he lets us into the Agriculture Ministry and does not do anything else to meet the other the other requirements to, to comply with the other re resolutions of the Security Council, it seems to me that it is likely that something will continue to happen until he gets into compliance. All right, now that brings us to the issue that has nagged uh, this country and others ever since the end of the Gulf War, the inconclusive end, with a lot of people saying we should have gone on and toppled Saddam Hussein. And you say, but the UN mandate did not reach to that kind of objective. Is that still our position, that the UN mandate does not authorize the toppling of Saddam Hussein? The only way I can answer that is to say that our objective and the UN mandate is to make sure that the Security Council resolutions are complied with. The fact of the matter is, when, when Desert Storm was on in the first place, it was not simply a question of, of the Security Council resolution. <clears throat> the President was wise enough to realize we had to have limited goals, and there was no way that we could assure we were going to get Saddam Hussein without going through all of Iraq, fighting in the streets of Baghdad, and then not being sure. There were limits to what we were prepared to do. Those limits still apply. What we have insisted upon, what we succeeded in with Desert Storm, and what we insist upon now is that he comply with the Security Council resolution. Well, given that, it's widely understood that since that time, the President has signed findings allowing a movement to topple Saddam Hussein to receive U.S. backing. If, if the Iraqis want to topple Saddam Hussein, and if they're smart, they will want to do so. With our help? Because they are the ones that are paying the price for this. I can only say to you, it will not break our hearts. Beyond that, I can't go. Let me pick up on something Sam was asking you to get you to just sort of say yes or no. Did we stop too soon? No. No. You mean in the first time? In the first time? No, okay. we did not. Uh, why not? Because we achieved the objectives. We got him out of Kuwait. We substantially reduced the size of his military. We removed the threat to Israel. We have largely, as a consequence of what we did the first time, removed his nuclear abilities, which were substantially greater than we thought they were. And the same is probably true with regard to his chemical weapons and maybe his biological okay. weapons. His weapons of mass destruction, which he had moved well along the development of, have largely been eliminated. And I think that is a great achievement. Well, if they've largely been eliminated, what precisely are we looking for now? The rest, or, or evidence of what might still be in existence so that it can also be destroyed. I'm not saying we've gotten everything. Uh, are you confident that, uh, how confident are you of our intelligence about this? Are we apt to be surprised as we were after the end of Desert Storm about the extent to which he had made progress? Well, I think that there are still things probably now, existing that would surprise us, but I can't be sure of that. One of the things that might surprise us are the uh, names of the nations that may be helping him. Do you have any or suspicion? Or have been helping. Or yeah. have been helping. Yeah. Who might they be? Oh, in terms of the past, I, uh, we have a fairly good idea. In I don't know that anybody specifically is today, but in terms of past sales from companies, for example, there are a number of West Europeans, for instance, that are implicated. There are a whole well, host of different that we're making sales to him. What do we know about about the role of Jordan as a country? Oh, uh, you mean now? Right there now. is no question that, there, that the, the embargo, that the limitation on, on imports into Iraq has been less than well uh, implemented by the Jordanians. How there are you, leaks. There's I mean, no are, question about that. Is the Jordanian government at some point to be considered an adversary of the United States? We have discussed this subject with the Jordanian government any number of times. I would say to you, I think that the um, that the policing of the process is much better now than it was. Adversary, no, but he's got a tough position, the king does. But there is no question in our judgment they have not satisfactorily Let me come back. Just one more question yeah. on the military. Yeah. You said there are lots of targets, and clearly there are. We can raise the the level of pain in Iraq, then we can set them back, we can make the rubble bounce. The question is, what evidence is there that it has the slightest impact on Saddam Hussein, who after all put his country through an awful meat grinder and 
prospered. In well, I, I think there are two points to be made here. The first of which, George, is whether it has any impact on him, on him or not. The fact of the matter is that this simply cannot go on, and there got to be ways to bring him into compliance. And I think this, that there are ways to do so. The second is, I think we need to understand that there is at least some reason to hope that at some point those around him in Iraq will decide they've had enough of this and will decide that he ought to be replaced. It's same. We have a little time Well, it's left. widely believed that uh, within the next three weeks or so, Secretary Baker will resign as Secretary of State to try to save the president's re-election campaign. And you will be the permanent acting Secretary of State. Would that be all right with you? Sam, let me make you a prediction. I'm acting Secretary today. The Secretary gets back tonight, at which point I revert to being Deputy Secretary. And I will wager you that for some time to come, I will be the Deputy Secretary of State and Jim Baker will be the Secretary. Well, some time could be three weeks. A You're certainly not than suggesting that. that what we have understood to be the case is not going to be the case. I certainly am suggesting to you that, that is, it is at least highly possible that that is not going to be the case. <laughs> wait a moment, wait a moment. I think we may either make some news or you're really throwing up a smoke screen here. Uh, Maybe some of both, but nevertheless, I happen to believe that Jim Baker will stay as Secretary of State for some long period of time to come. And the Middle East is one obvious reason for that. And I, all of this speculation, which Jim has himself tried to put to rest on this trip, I think is a bunch of nonsense. Well, I'm Deputy Secretary. That's what I think I will remain. Prime Minister Rabin is coming, what, in two weeks? Before the, just before the uh, Republican All right, convention. two and a half weeks or so. And it was said that, uh, yes, Secretary Baker will stay in place through the Rabin visit to get the loan guarantees set, and then he would resign. There is uh, meetings on the Middle East scheduled for late August as well here in Washington. Uh, Sam, I am not, I don't have a crystal ball, and I'm not Jim Baker, and I'm not George Bush, but I am predicting to you that I will be Deputy Secretary for some long period of time to come, and Jim Baker will be Secretary. That, and Jim Baker will be Secretary? Yes, it's not Well, the I... final question, then. I know our time is up, David. Final question. Are you suggesting that it's possible that Jim Baker would take a leave of absence? No, 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 no. I'm saying that Jim Baker will be the Secretary of State for some long period of time, and all of this speculation about his departing within the next week or two weeks or three weeks, I think is nonsense. Well, if he remains, no, will George be Bush be the be president wrong. for a long Yes, George Bush will be president till the 20th of January. Then I don't know what happens. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> we know what happens now. I have to thank you for being right, time to up. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming. Pleasure <clears> to have you. you. Coming next, a background report on what is happening in the presidential election. And we'll hear from former and present members of the Bush cabinet, William Bennett and Jack Kemp in a month. Bit by bit. The Xerox guarantee is no ordinary guarantee. I said show me. And he did. It says Xerox will replace any product for any reason at your request for three years. It all depends on execution. It's about a relationship that makes your satisfaction the measure of everything we do. It's the words we live by, and it's from Xerox. They mean what they say. Vaccine, copy, print. Xerox, the document company. Something is terribly wrong with these pictures, but you could look all day and not see it. The problem is carbon monoxide, an invisible, deadly pollutant emitted in auto exhaust. Fortunately, there's a way to help reduce these emissions. Ethanol, a renewable fuel derived from corn grown by the American farmer. And beginning November 1st, the Clean Air Act will require motor vehicles to use oxygenated fuels such as ethanol in 39 of the nation's most polluted cities during the five winter months. In 1988, when the program was introduced in the Denver area, atmospheric levels of carbon monoxide dropped 8% in the first two months. And this coming winter in Denver, the use of ethanol blended fuels is expected to exceed 50% market share. So while the problem may be invisible, the solution is becoming clearer every day. Now there are cars and trucks that run on clean burning natural gas. Yeah, but how clean can it be? Natural gas reduces the emissions that cause smog by 80%. Yeah, but what does it cost? It's like saving 40 cents a gallon on gasoline. Yeah, but where does it come from? Natural gas comes from right here in North America. Yeah, but who makes the vehicles? America's automakers are turning out fleets of natural gas cars and trucks. Yeah, but do they come with tinted windows? <laughs> Would this man make the critical difference in November? And what about his wife, the woman who took on rock and roll? 
Alan Tipper Gore sent down with prime time Thursday. The sneak attack to destroy Saddam's nuclear capability. The only top guns with the capability of doing it share their daring mission with 2020 Friday. Now we are turning to the political news in this country, and we begin with a second background report from Jack Smith. Jack? David, it was a week Republicans would probably gladly have skipped. Not only did the president get heckled and seem to lose his composure, would you please shut up and sit down? But the economic news was glum, and polls continued to show the GOP ticket trailing badly. Anytime you find an incumbent president 30 points behind in the poll, it is realistic to say that he's in trouble. The question is, can that trouble be surmounted? And the answer is yes. Conservatives have been openly sniping at the president and say he should move to the right. I think the, uh, it's fair to say that George Bush is a big business, uh, Wall Street, country club Republican. And Dan Quayle didn't help much this week when he was asked in an interview what he'd do if his daughter, when grown, wanted an abortion. The decision was abortion, you'd support her. As a I'd, I'd support my daughter. That sounded a lot like choice. Not at all. It, uh, we are pro-life. Uh, we are uh, opposed uh, to abortion. Some saw a double standard, and GOP moderates, desperate for a way to move the president up in the polls, started a dump quail campaign. Uh, the vice president's chair a little uncertain. No, it's very certain, and I'm not going to take any questions. But reports say Bush seriously discussed the possibility of quail leaving the ticket and dropped it. With the party split, a lot of GOP hopes are riding on James Baker to save George Bush now. He's a solution for a lot of the disorganization in the campaign, but not for the weak economy, and perhaps not for George Bush's inability to convey any sense of what he wants to do. Right or wrong, many Republicans worry that George Bush is perceived by a lot of voters as a president whose only real domestic agenda is getting himself re-elected in November. David? Jack, thank you. Mr. Bennett, thank you for coming. It's nice to have you. If you were running the Bush campaign, seems to be in trouble. If you were running it, what would you do? What would you suggest to him? Well, I would suggest the president have a conversation with himself and uh, ask himself the following two questions. Uh, do I really want to do this? And what is it I really want to do? Uh, once answering those questions, and uh, I imagine they'd both be answered in the affirmative, yes, I really want to do this, and he comes up with some sense of what he wants to do, then he has to give the nation a clear sense of that, of that plan and that passion. Uh, politics in this uh, last hundred days will be about uh, his action and his vision and his passion. Uh, to be is, uh, is to act and I think to act passionately and that's I think what's, what's missing. Uh, without that serious conversation with, it, with himself and without that serious sense of resolve, I think we'll continue to drift. Is there some doubt in your mind that he is eager to continue as president? That no, first question I th no, would I imply that there was some doubt. No, I think he does want to continue. I I'm sure that's the case. But, you know, events have a momentum of their own. And if you're sitting in that job which he's sitting in, everyone is assuming this and assuming that, he has to decide because he is the president, he is the candidate. And what people are looking for is leadership from him, is conviction from him. And I think in this last hundred days, that's what we need to see. I have no doubt that he wants this job. What he needs to give the country is a sense of why he wants this job. What are his plans? What are his priorities? What are his passions? So the country wants leadership. You're saying it has not been having, had not had leadership? I think it's not clear to people what will happen in the next four years. It's not clear what the priorities will be because I think the campaign, and here I openly critical the campaign, has been lurching here and lurching there. It's not giving a clear sense of what it is and what it's about. Uh, empirically, an answer to David, you say empirically the president does want the job. There's an ethical question. And that is, should he want the job? That is, uh, is it not arguable that he would serve his party, perhaps his reputation, and arguably the nation better by not running? There's an argument if, uh, I th if, if you decide that uh, it's not something that he has a clear idea about or that he doesn't have a governing passion about. Look, if George Bush were to step down, I think uh, the nation would give him his, uh, its thanks and say, uh, <clears throat> your generation won the Cold War. Uh, you did a good job. Thank you very much. And I think he would be treated. Uh, he would be treated well. I'm confident that's not what George Bush uh, wants. I'm confident that he wants to uh, be president again. But <clears throat> at this point in time, and you are looking at 30 points, it won't do just to show up. 
Uh, what he has to do, again, is give some sense of what it is he wants to do and suggest to the people uh, this, uh, this vision and this conviction about, uh, about the future. He's 68 years old. Mm -hmm. He's been in public <coughs> life since 1967. You served his administration, mm -hmm. yet when you come to this familiar man and he says, uh, Bennett, will you work in my campaign? You said essentially no, because I don't know what you're about. Now, if at age 68, after 20-some years uh, in public life, 25 years, he doesn't know and doesn't have what you call the grand passion, how apt does he have to get it before Labor Day? Well, we'll see. I mean, I have, I have the greatest regard for him. I, I, he's personally one of the most impressive people I've met. Uh, in many ways, I think he is, he is what people should be in public life in terms of the conduct of his, uh, of his personal life. The reason I didn't sign on is I have very serious disagreements with the campaign and the way the campaign is running, the way they reacted to the Perot situation, for example. Do you still? But yes, I do. Uh, <clears throat> but the question is, is George Bush? And, and the question is, what does he want? Uh, does he want to do this? And does he have a clear idea of what he wants to do? If he doesn't, if he doesn't, then of course he shouldn't do it. You just listed a, among the okay. disagreements you have the reaction of the campaign to the Perot. Right. When Perot was in the race, he was a temperamental tycoon who was right. unstable and right. contemptuous of the Constitution. When he left, he was wise and courageous. Now, some people look at this and they say, these people, words don't mean anything to them. Should they be trusted with power if they can't be trusted with words? Well, the campaign's much too cynical. I, I agree with you. The one day that Perot lives up to everything that uh, Republican strategists have been saying about him, uh, all these terrible things, in fact, acts even worse, uh, that's the day they choose to praise him and call his actions wise and uh, courageous. And you really have to be careful when you call actions wise and courageous, because children may be listening. Uh, be very, very careful. <laughs> Mr. Bennett, uh, the polls suggest that the ticket would be strengthened if Dan Quayle were not on it. And I think you agree, is it, you not? No, I, I think that you might see a bump for a few days. After that, I think it would, uh, it would go down, because people would say George Bush was uh, one of the things that George Bush is is loyal, and now he's shown that he's not very loyal. Uh, and uh, it would look like panic and so on. I think the quail thing is a great distraction, but here's another example of why this is such a bad job, Vice President. The job description from hell, if you will. You know, when any, in, in addition to everything else, when something goes wrong, you will be the first person we will think about throwing overboard. When, when George Bush was at 85%, Dan Quayle was Vice President. Uh, he's, not, he's not the problem. But the people who didn't like Dan Quayle then don't like him now, and for the same reasons. It has nothing to do with whether George Bush was at 85% or 30%. Right. Right, well, but if you ask a lot of questions now about should George Bush change X and filled in the blank with I'm asking almost only about anybody, Dan Quayle at the no, moment. No, I think you'd get high numbers because the, the high dissatisfaction numbers, the right track, wrong track numbers. But I think in the, in, the, in the long run, and the run wouldn't be very long, it would be about a week, I think it would hurt George Bush more. All right, let's talk about the, the things that are going wrong in the campaign. Uh, Mr. Bush's advisor sent him to Panama, or he sent himself to Panama, so he can be heckled in the streets and driven by tear gas. They sent him to the MIA convention so he can be heckled, and that was predictable, and lose his cool. Uh, what's going on there, and can that be fixed? Well, without a governing rationale, without a clear sense, and a clear sense of priorities, this is what's going to happen. You're going to lurch uh, from, one, uh, from one event to another. Now, we're in the last hundred days. Uh, the first hundred days uh, is not too early to act. The last hundred days is not too late to act. But act the president must do. I mean, I think what he has to do is take a series of executive actions, uh, executive orders. So he can, he can revoke that affirmative action order. He can index capital gains. He can do all sorts of things. But again, he must act and give people some sense of what the next four years uh, will be like. That's what he's got to do. And it's got to have clear definition. But he has no way to make a quick fix on the economy. And is that not his basic problem? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I know everybody says this is, the, this is the big issue. When I look at the polls, I see the economy getting more votes than anything else, but it's about 15 or 20 percent, and then it's spread out all over the place. I think the issue is leadership, and I think that the president can still respond to that, but there's only one way to respond to the issue of leadership, and that is to lead. And what do you do about the campaign when it comes to the tactics of the Gore and the Clinton ticket. Well, right. it's the Clinton Gore ticket. Well, I, th I think you can. I mean, these, you can beat these guys. These guys look better. They look like Spin and Marty. It's not Dukakis in a tank. Uh, these guys look better, and they will re react better. But they have said for openers, 150 billion dollars in taxes. Now, if that's openers, what's to follow? I mean, I think there are opportunities here. You have to say what what seems to be the case is not the case with these guys. That what's what's really behind uh, 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 Gore and uh, and Clinton. Uh, is that uh, Liberal Democratic Party. And I think there was enough evidence in New York with the censure by Just Casey uh, and other things that took place up there to make that case. What's your hunch? Who wins? 
Very, uh, very close and uphill for us right now. George, we've got a few seconds. Well, change is the mantra this year. Everyone wants to be the candidate of change. You have a president who can't change his treasury secretary or won't change him. Uh, do you think, if there should be a penalty for failure in government, that the people who are the architects of a failed economic policy should go, particularly Darman and Brady? Well, I, th this could be among the actions he takes. Again, he could say... What do you think? What I, what I think, what I think is, is mm. without getting into any particular individuals, oh, I think yeah, he, he should, in. no, no, I won't. He, he could say, <laughs> here's my team, you want here's my team for the, for the second term. Here's my team. Here are the people I'll have in the cabinet, and these are the ideas that will animate uh, those, uh, mm. those people. Wouldn't be a bad idea at all. Mr. Bennett, thank you. Thanks thank very you. much for coming. Pleasure to yeah. have you. Coming next, Jack Kemp, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Bush cabinet, in a moment. Beautiful, isn't it? The family farm, owned and operated by men and women who are motivated by pride and a deep love of the land. Parents who pass on the knowledge and tradition of farming to their children. But the family farm is much more than picturesque. It is one of America's strongest resources, the most productive farm system in the world. The American farmer is also a steward of the land, using modern tillage practices to ensure the land will be productive in the generations to come. Why do we at ADM care so much about the family farm? Because we depend on its high productivity in order to fulfill our role as supermarket to the world. This week with David Brinkley, we'll continue in a moment. Death from friendly fire during the Gulf War. Who's to blame? An exclusive interview with an accused officer and the mother of the soldier who died on the next Good Morning America. The label on blue jeans, eyeglasses, or neckties says they're special, better than the rest. And now there's a label on drinking water. Sparkling clear drinking water with the contaminants taken care of. Water that tastes better by itself and better in coffee, tea, and other beverages. So if you appreciate the finer things in life, you'll appreciate the finest drinking water. And whose label goes on the equipment to make this better water? Culligan, of course. Today, you get a lot more than soft water when you call. Hey, Culligan, man. The Salt Lake Mormon Tabernacle Choir will be bringing their nationally acclaimed musical program to Hilton Coliseum in Ames on July 28th. The 325-voice Mormon Tabernacle Choir is known for its extraordinary ability to uplift and inspire people everywhere. Tickets available at the Iowa State Center box office and all Ticketmaster outlets, or you can charge by phone. The Salt Lake Mormon Tabernacle Choir at Hilton Coliseum in Ames, Tuesday, July 28th at 7.30 p.m. Truly one of the world's great choirs. You're watching Channel 5. Secretary Kemp, thanks for coming in today. Pleased that you're Good in California. Good morning, David. Good morning. You're in California, right? How, in Santa Rosa, California. How does it look there for the Bush quail ticket? They've been uh, having problems in California. Oh, they really have. Uh, every newspaper column in California talks about the decline in the value of both residential and commercial real estate. There's tremendous pressures on the revenue base. There's a big budget gap because of the collapse of commercial real estate, particularly loss of aerospace jobs. So California is in tough economic shape, and it really uh, requires, in my view, a uh, bold action, uh, not only from the administration, but from the Congress. Uh, and uh, my hope is that that is the type of leadership we provide, a vigorous plan and strategy to get America moving again, get the economy growing again, to create more jobs, and to restore value to the financial and fixed asset values of the American people and give other people access to assets. As you see it, what's wrong with the Bush campaign? It's running very poorly in the polls. Well, what's the frustration, well, the frustration really is over uh, uh, the economy in large part. Uh, the American people have the perception, unfortunately, uh, that uh, the Republican administration uh, cannot get anything through the United States Congress. And there's one good reason for that, and that is the Congress is absolutely obstinate in passing anything that smacks of a George Bush uh, pro-growth, uh, pro-inner city agenda. Let me give you a quick example, uh, David. Uh, this week, uh, on Tuesday, Senator Benson, the chairman, very distinguished chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, is going to take up enterprise zones. Now, there was a riot in Los Angeles at the end of April. 
They have yet to pass an enterprise zone bill that would not only go into Los Angeles and South Central and East LA and Compton and North Long Beach and other areas of Southern California, but to East Palo Alto or East Harlem or East St. Louis. And it's absolutely, in my view, uh, a hoax to pass an enterprise zone bill, which the Senate is marking up, thanks to Senator Benson, who's a friend of mine with a high regard for each other, but it has no capital-based incentive, no entrepreneurial-based incentive, and simply is going to have about 10 or 12 zones, one Indian reservation, one of the colonias, and nothing else. And that is a, that's going to be a hoax. Uh, I, I hope to God that the Congress and the Senate will respond to Los Angeles with something other than a teeny-weeny enterprise zone bill with no incentives for entrepreneurship Secret for minority men and women. Secretary Kemp, uh, you, you say Congress has been an opponent of the sort of bold measures you wish to have taken, but your, your opponents and detractors have included Secretary Brady and Mr. Darman, who are thought to be the architect of an economic policy that are, is thought to be a failure. Do you think they should go? Well, look, Sam, that's not I'm my uh, call, and I'm sure you would uh, <laughs> recognize how unseemly it would be for the Secretary of Housing to be talking about other members of the President's cabinet. That's the President's call, and uh, I respect that very much. The, the problem is not personnel as much as it's policy. We have given the impression to the American people that we put the budget and fixing the budget ahead of fixing the economy. But we who must did that? tell the American people how we're going to fix the economy and get it growing again. But what you're complaining about uh, are <clears throat> measures and policies associated with personnel. Well, to be sure. But uh, this has always been a party, uh, certainly since Ronald Reagan and George Bush won in 1980, that believed in raising the tide of economic activity so all boats could rise, fixing boats that are sunk on the bottom of the harbor, injecting opportunity and growth and jobs into the inner cities of America. We must reach out to African American no. and Hispanic American. I want to see the party of Lincoln be the party of Abraham Lincoln, not the party of Herbert Hoover. One of the tasks of the Republican campaign, as it defines it, evidently is to make Clinton look scary. Now, let me ask you this. How do you get conservatives and moderate mainstream Americans uh, frightened about the Clinton ticket when the Bush, uh, cam the Bush administration has uh, a rate of increase of domestic spending uh, twice as fast as under Jimmy Carter? The Federal Register, which lists uh, the regulations, is now larger than it has been since Jimmy Carter. The deficit, of course, is a, is a scandal. Uh, how do you say, I mean, what is the campaign slogan? Clinton would be even worse? <laughs> well, I've heard you say that before, uh, George, so I give you credit for a good uh, polemical point. Uh, but look, is it the uh, we cannot go to the American, <laughs> we cannot, in my view, go to the American people and simply attack Democrats and attack Clinton and Gore as big L liberals and big spenders and big taxes, big taxers without making our case. Uh, that we would do things differently. Mario Cuomo, in my view, showed the Achilles heel of the Democratic Party. That is, on a rival network a couple of weeks ago, he said, Bill Clinton has the courage to raise our taxes. And Mario Cuomo was right. They want to raise the income tax <coughs> rate to 38. They want to put a surtax. And there's no place in recorded economic U.S. history in which putting a surtax on a weak economy did anything but weaken it more, create more loopholes, more shelters, lose more revenue. And the, while the incidence of taxation is placed upon so-called soaking the rich, it ends up soaking the middle class and soaking the poor. We have to compare our uh, proposals with their proposals and do it in a rational, logical, objective, empirical way. And I hope that in our platform, we have a flatter, lower, uh, fairer, uh, 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 lower tax rate system that will reduce those 40,000 pages of IRS regulations down to about four and then make our case that we're going to fight for it. Mr. Secretary? Uh, the name Jack Kemp is now being used in this town and elsewhere outside the Beltway as a name that should be accompanying George Bush on the ticket this fall, meaning that Dan Quayle should not be on the ticket. You agree? Oh, it's not going to happen, Sam. It's not going to happen. Uh, uh, Dan is a very good friend of mine, and I agree with Bill Bennett. Uh, the problem is not uh, the personnel or the, uh, the ticket itself. The problem is that the perception by the American people has been allowed to occur by a Republican president that we are the problem of this economy well, Secretary, rather than where it lies, and that is with the United States Congress. I'm asking you about Dan Quayle, who for the entire well, I three said, and I, I don't half think years, or almost four years now, has been the butt <laughs> of, uh, of jokes in this country. It is not a new problem. When the president was 85% in the polls, Dan Quayle was still, by a lot of Americans, considered to be a joke. 
Dan Quayle has been a loyal, faithful, uh, very articulate well, so was Sancho Panza. Of the president and our party and our policies and our platform. Well, well, the problem is not Dan Quayle or George Bush. The problem is showing the American people right. that we will fight for that zeitgeist, if you will, that spirit of the times, which is to privatize public property, to lower right. the tax rates on labor uh, and capital, and to encourage African American and minority men and right. women to get jobs and equality right, of opportunity. Yeah, Secretary Camp, let me, let me change the subject slightly. Uh, the Vice President was asked on television the other day about uh, abortion <laughs> and his position, and gave an answer that has gotten him in trouble with some anti-abortion groups when he said he would support his daughter, his grown, if his daughter were grown, if she if she elected to have an abortion you have two oh, grown you have two no, grown daughters what would be your answer to that question no that, that first of all it's a very cheap shot at dan quayle he he, he uh, like any father who was talking about his 13 year old daughter this is the equivalent of other people uh, who were racist asking what would you do if your sister married a person of another color or another religion or something like that it's a cheap shot at dan quayle but it's not the he same was thing talking at all intimately Secretary. about his own feelings no he was talking intimately about his own feelings he, he should have told the press that it's none of their business what a father talks to his daughter about particularly when she's 13 years old it's a shame that it is an issue but well, he he did not offend pro-life or pro-family or people who are concerned about the loss of life in america but you have no objection to his answer do you when he said he would support his daughter where she grown and made I, that kind of I decision have, i have no objection to his answer my wife didn't have any objection to his answer but i frankly don't think he should have answered it in the first place what a father talks to his daughter what a mother tells her 13 year old daughter should be between a mother and a father uh, and not to uh, be made a part of a national uh, uh, political campaign, in my view, in my uh, humble opinion. I, I take it the platform is not going to change on this issue of abortion, but that the convention is going to allow people of different views to address the convention. Is that correct? Well, I, I would hope so. I'd like to see Bob Casey address our uh, convention. They wouldn't let him speak at the Democratic convention. I think it is healthy to have a debate over an issue that is divisive and it is emotional. And I want all men and women of goodwill and civility who believe in equality of opportunity, who believe in economic growth, who believe in making the world more democratic, small d, Sam, small d, uh, to be a part of our party of Abraham Lincoln. We're not going to do it by dividing. We're going to do it by transcending uh, some of these uh, more divisive issues. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thanks very much for coming thank in, you, talking David. with us. Have a nice time in California and come and see us uh, when you come back. Thank you. Coming next, our discussion here and joining us will be ABC's chief foreign correspondent, pa Pierre Selinger. In a moment. Late one night in 1953, in a darkened GE laboratory, a remarkable breakthrough occurred. An experiment in liquid polymers took an unexpected turn. Dan Fox, the young scientist who found it the next morning, had no idea what he'd created. But it was crystal clear and incredibly strong, even under the most extreme conditions. It was Lexan. The first of GE's engineered plastics. Plastics that would soon make it possible for architects to express themselves more brilliantly. It would make a car designer's best ideas even better. And help doctors in their life-saving work. Because what Dan Fox had discovered was something we at GE have always believed. You never know where the next great idea will come from. Or how far it will take you. Dean Witter believed every success story was unique. We have a sacred trust to protect our investors. Whether it's the success of a small business. To maintain conservative policies. Saving for college. To put the interest of our clients first. Or planning an early retirement. From getting in on the ground floor to getting all the way to the top, Dean Witter is there to help every client make it every step of the way. Dean Witter. We measure success one investor at a time. Look what ADM Research has cooked up. An all-vegetable patty that contains dietary fiber is low in fat and free of cholesterol. One that's made to meet the demands of vegetarians and other health-conscious consumers. It's the Midland Harvest brand, Harvest Burger. And so far, it's made a big impression everywhere it's landed. ADM, supermarket to the world. 
Today, it's double the golf action with two championship events. First, the game's legends tee it up at the final round of the British Senior Open. Then, the brightest stars in women's golf battle it out for our national crown. Defending champ Meg Mallon and the LPGA's best meet in the final round of the U.S. Women's Open live. It's all today on ABC Sports. Pierre, we're glad to have you with us. Glad Pleasure you to be here. Hope you enjoy it. Now, um, Mr. Bush, the Bush campaign is in trouble. No question about that. Um, why? There's an easy one for you. Don't tell me the economy. We all know that. No, I what? think that uh, one of the things that we've overlooked totally is that uh, he has done very bad on foreign policy. Here's a man who uh, got the, the impression to the American people that that was his big thing. He was great on foreign policy. Uh, he made some disastrous mistakes uh, before the Gulf crisis in the way he was uh, patting uh, Saddam Hussein on the head. Uh, he made a disastrous mistake, in my opinion, by not going all the way to Baghdad. I'll tell you an interesting little story in passing of that. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher, who was thrown out as uh, prime minister in November of 1990, uh, is telling her friends that if she'd still been prime minister, George Bush would have gone all the way to Baghdad. Well, of course, that makes some sense because she's the one that convinced him that war was the way to go. And uh, I think he handled the Soviet Union badly. He didn't see the possibility of it breaking up. I think that the American government has handled the Yugoslavia crisis badly. Uh, so I think that uh, foreign policy is one of the things... That's what got him in trouble, you think? Well, I think it's beginning. People in the, in the United States are beginning to understand that not only is the economy in trouble, not only the local and national issues in trouble, but also foreign policy issues. George, what do you think of that? Well, I think that that's a small part of it, that uh, the luster clearly <coughs> has gone off the Gulf War as an achievement. But more than that, I think there's just a sense that the Bush administration is strangely passive and inert an old saying that, uh, you know, if, if you can keep your head while all those around you are losing theirs, you probably don't understand <laughs> the situation. <laughs> and uh, th there <laughs> probably ought to be a, a more sign of uh, good, wholesome, realistic, rational panic in the White House right now. Well, so, I approach it from the other end. I think the economy is the main reason, however, not the only reason. And it is something which is not just in the hands of the gods, and Bush was inevitably going to have a recession here. I think he's mishandled that also. But well, I think, interrupt a second, yeah. because I, I am very doubtful that a president can control the economy. Uh, I don't think Bush could end the recession on some schedule. The president cannot repeal the business cycle. I, I think that's correct. But when this all, when, when we went into the double dip last fall, early winter, in December, after there had been euphoria in the summer, okay, we're going to come out of it, and we didn't come out of it. At that point, the president needed to move forcefully. You remember he waited 60 Doing days. Doing what? Well, he waited 60 days to put out a plan in his State of the Union message. He needed to have come forward right away. He showed his concern by going and buying some socks in a store up near JCP, Camp David. Yeah. That's not good enough. I think he's mishandled, if you want to say I'm talking about public relations, so be it. He's mishandled his approach to convincing the American people that he was serious about a program to restore the economy of the country. I think that George said something earlier in the program that it's very important to understand, and that is that Perhaps the real decision has to be made by George Bush himself. Is he really going to be intelligent by running for president this year, or is he going to pull out of the campaign? Now, as we see what happened uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, the Conservative Party understood that Mrs. Thatcher had lost her popularity with the British people. And so they knew that an election was going to take place in 1992. They got rid of her. And they replaced her with another fellow, and despite all the polls which showed that the Labor Party was going to win, the Conservative Party won with John Major as Prime Minister. Well, Pierre, I don't think there's, well, there's always one chance in a million, but I don't think there's any real chance that the President is not going to run for re-election. The question is, is he serious enough, and I think Bill Bennett did put it right, is he serious enough to do the things necessary? He once told us he'd do anything to get re-elected. In my view, one of the things he needs to do is to have Dan Quayle come in and say, Mr. President, I'm a drag on the ticket. I know you haven't tried to kick me off, and I respect that, but I'm going to take myself off. That would help the president. And I disagree that it would just be a one-week bounce. Oh, yes, there'd be a little bounce. But think of all the weeks to come in the campaign that Dan Quayle would not be out there with his foot in his mouth and on all of the comic pages. That's a plus. Well, well how about this? Mr. Bush tells us over and over that I sent Congress a bill to do this, do that, do the other. Congress refused to pass it. Would Lyndon Johnson have done that? Would Franklin Roosevelt have done that? Would Harry Truman have done that? He would have gone to Congress and said, 
in language that I can't use on the air, you either give me this bill or you're going to pay a price. You will not get the bridge you want. You will not get the roads. You will not get the money. Give it to me now. They would have. And they would it, give it to him. But it's different today. Well, it not really that much. is. The old days of Lyndon Johnson, the majority leader, Sam Rayburn, the speaker, they aren't up there. Tom Foley doesn't have that power anymore. And George Bush doesn't have the kind of clout. I watched Ronald Reagan, so did you, get Couldn't through his tax bill. Couldn't he arouse the American public to demand that Congress give him what he wanted? Well, now you're talking about leadership. And yes, I suppose another president, another individual, might have brought the American public along. Of course, but, there might be uh, something that might help this country. I mean, there, we do have a lot of frustration about politics in this country. Not only in this country, but in many democratic countries in Western Europe, for example. But if we were to return to a possibility of having a president and a Congress of the same party, which we haven't had for a long time, you know. it might make some small contribution. Well, I Dan Quayle, Dan Quayle, to his credit this week, said, vote up with us or against us, but vote for a Congress of the same party you know, to, to mm -hmm. locate responsibility. Could be the American people rather like gridlock. I mean, we complain about it in Washington. I'm not sure the country is eager for the government to do whatever it would do if were it unleashed. Can, can I say something about Dan Quayle? I was just going to ask you what your view was. My view is that Dan Quayle uh, will be a drag on the ticket. I want to say, so I think he's been a good vice president. I would rather he were president than George Bush. I think he has more ideas and more honest passion about American politics. I'm not talking justice to Dan Quayle. It's not just to dump Dan Quayle. It's politics. And what matters is not whether Quayle is on the ticket up, but who you would replace him with. And I think, as I thought in 1980 and said in 1980, that Colin Powell would be an ideal uh, choice. It would be an act of, of great public service for two reasons. First of all, he is an experienced man who has been around power a long time and, and could be trusted with power if he had to become president. Not a negligible consideration when picking a vice president. But second, the good it would do this country to have that articulate, uh, seasoned, veteran, educated, witty, black male in a position of national leadership. Well, George, you know, you know, I think one of the real problems is, I don't think George Bush can get rid of Dan Quayle because he is the one that personally selected him and made him his vice presidential candidate in 1988. But, yeah, you know how these and therefore, it would be another argument against George Bush. What a stupid man you are, George. Why did you pick that guy in 1988? Well, what are you saying, Pierre, that George Bush put a millstone around his neck and this year he should say, well, I put it around my <laughs> neck, I guess I'll just drown with it. Well, Take the millstone off, I, I even though you were... I a better fellow than most people well, are right, saying there's, about him. There's a discussion. Let me just address this point on Colin Powell. You said it in 1988, not 1980. Sorry, okay, yeah. mine goes first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, I, I made so many experience. steps on this show, George, <laughs> forgive me. Uh, I agree with you. Everyone inside the Beltway seems to agree with you. I've said it, you've said it. You know, every, Hickory, everybody says it. But I wonder in the country whether the addition of Colin Powell would matter. I think it would. Let's but I would think in some... Ma what's that? Matter in what way? Would it help Bush or hurt him? Well, I just, it would neutralize to some extent the Democratic ticket, no question about it. Well, and it, it would eat into the traditional Democratic base of one of its biggest voting uh, constituencies, no doubt about it. I think you have to go back to what Bennett said, uh, and said it even more the other day in the Wall Street Journal. The problem is not Dan Quayle. The problem is above Dan Quayle. The problem is George Bush. And if you saw a poll this morning, not the national poll, but this is a poll that's a really frightening thing for the Republicans. They're losing in Orange County, California. Now, let me tell you, a Republican Shades never loses Reagan. it. Right. Uh, what poll? Uh, I didn't see that. What yeah, poll was that? It's uh, Clinton is leading Bush in Orange County, well, California. Is that is the desperate situation. Is it possible that the conventional wisdom is wrong? What is the conventional wisdom today? Today it is, oh, well, this 30-point bounce, that won't last. It'll no. be a very tight election. I've spouted that myself. Is it possible that, in fact, it's not going to be a very tight election, and we already see the dimension? After, uh, I think the, re the average gain for the Republicans in some of the recent elections after the convention was about 18 points won't do this time. You mean if, if Bush gets that kind of bounce? Enough. That's right. That's right. So is there anything left to do, for him to do, in the short time remaining? Well, I th I th the, the inertia in this administration is quite stunning. I mean, as Sam mentioned in one of his questions, they send him to places they shouldn't send him. He had no business yeah. being in Panama where they had tear gas on site. They had no business sending him to audiences where will, we could expect di uh, a disagreement. I will tell you, you know, some, I, seconds, I, I, I talked to someone who said it's Bush calling the shots. He's not some dummy being I manipulated by his advisors. He's the guy who's decided, I'll wait till after the Republican convention to come out swinging. So let's see if he has a punch. Well, we'll see shortly. We'll be back in a moment.
1862, the average American farmer fed five people for one year. Today, he feeds more than 90, not just Americans, but people around the world as well. Obviously, as a leading processor of food ingredients, we at the Archer Daniels Midland Company couldn't survive without the American farmer. But then, neither could you. Hoping. Waiting. Like each Olympic athlete, the world waits for immediate results of over 400 events. So Xerox designed a touchscreen document network that makes printed results instantly available in four languages to journalists and fans everywhere at the 92 Barcelona Games, helping the Olympic Games set new records. Scanning, copying, printing. Xerox, the document company. GE is a family of many different kinds of people, and while it may not look like it, they all have the same job, bringing good things to life. We are the spark in the engine, the twist in the night, a voice in the dark from a million miles away. We are the people. When you put a 12-year-old to work on a railroad, it may be a great way to connect schoolwork with the real world. Plus, when you go to an accredited hospital, you expect the best care, right? Well, the truth about accreditation may shock you. On ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings this week. Well, we've all talked a lot today, but we still didn't get it all in, so we'll try another time. That's all the time we have today. We ask you to stay with ABC News for the latest on the Iraqi situation and for a complete report on World News Sunday with Forrest Sawyer later today. For all of us here at ABC News, until next week, thank you. This Week with David Brinkley, brought to you by ADN, Supermarket to the World, and by GE. From satellites to medical systems, we bring good things to life. Send $5 to 1535 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203. This Week with David Brinkley is a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. Monday. A Happy Days Gang will take you back to one of America's best-loved shows with rarely seen bloopers of your favorite stars. A Happy Days Reunion, Monday. I like to get a new car every two or three years. Now, Cadillac offers a 30-month lease on the Cadillac Seville. Why pay for the whole car when you only need to pay for the portion you use? Since you simply pay for the period of time you drive, monthly payments total only $17,670 after your down payment. See your Cadillac dealer for details. It could change the way you think about American automobiles. The label on blue jeans, eyeglasses, or neckties says they're special, better than the rest. 
And now there's a label on drinking water. Sparkling clear drinking water with the contaminants taken care of. Water that tastes better by itself and better in coffee, tea, and other beverages. So if you appreciate the finer things in life, you'll appreciate the finest drinking water. And whose label goes on the equipment to make this better water?